Okay, so uh, I'll, I'll hand the next uh, session to our chairs, um, John Chenfine and Harsh Kanhari. Um, thank you for, for coming, um, and uh, we'll crack on. Thank you. Are these mics on? I think these mics are on. I think um, the next session is essentially uh, squamous cell carcinoma of the esophagus, <coughs> um, uh, early disease, and also uh, that of uh, gastric uh, early disease. Uh, our speakers have uh, already been introduced numerous times. I'm, I'm not going to go back through their accolades, but I think we'll just, we'll just crack straight on. I think Professor Chu is uh, kicking off with detection and characterization of early squamous cell carcinoma. Professor Chu. Thank you very much. Um, morning. Um, first of all, I'd like to thank uh, Raj for his uh, kind invitation. I'm very happy to be here in Adelaide. This is my first time to visit here, and I enjoy, enjoy very much of the fresh air because uh, now in Hong Kong, we are all wearing masks uh, all the time. Even at the shopping arcade, I see nobody without a mask. But uh, Anyway, so my uh, topic is about detection and characterization of early squamous cell carcinoma of the esophagus. And, uh, <clears throat> well, for uh, us uh, working, I'm actually an upper GI surgeon uh, doing esophagectomy, gastrectomy. So uh, esophageal cancer is really difficult to, for us to treat because um, it's probably not the most common cancer worldwide. It's, it's one of the... Uh, kind of the most difficult cancer to treat because it's a common cause of cancer death. Um, we all know that the prognosis of this esophageal cancer related to the stage of uh, the detection. If we can recognize early esophageal cancer, I think that's the best chance for the, our patient um, to receive uh, probably endoscopic treatment and have the best chance of survival. But uh, we all know also that uh, this kind of uh, early esophageal cancer, it's difficult to detect during endoscopy. Um, this is one of the uh, studies from uh, UK, a retrospective course study for patients who were diagnosed to have esophageal cancer. Uh, and uh, when they look back, uh, out of these 7,000 new cases, 8% of them received an endoscopy three to 36 months before the diagnosis. So if you have stage zero or one early disease, you have a higher percentage of having one endoscopy before the uh, confirmed diagnosis. And this is the same in Hong Kong. Uh, when we look back into our data, 70% of these patients have an endoscopy three to 36 months before. So we are thinking that probably we are missing some of these uh, early esophageal cancer. So why would uh, we be missing? And uh, one of the reasons is because early squamous esophageal cancer is only represented by slight mucosal irregularity. It's quite difficult to recognize because of this subtle change under white light endoscopy, as uh, you can see from this arrow. So it's just a slight irregularity of the mucosa. And sometimes it's only a slight increase in the redness because of the changes in the vascularity, which is the um, the uh, early feature for uh, esophageal uh, squamous uh, neoplasia. So uh, recently uh, we published uh, an uh, Asian consensus on the standard of diagnostic uh, upper endoscopy for neoplasia. Uh, this is uh, actually uh, working uh, very closely between uh, all the members of the uh, MBIC uh, and uh, of course me and Noria is uh, on uh, this uh, setting of standard and also Raj. And uh, when we publish this, uh, we look into the whole workflow of how we should do upper GI diagnostic endoscopy. I'm not going to go through all these statements, but just to uh, say saying that uh, the diagnostic procedure is not only about how we perform the procedure, but uh, very importantly, including risk stratification, whether you have uh, recognized the presence of high-risk uh, findings, uh, and also the uh, premalignant uh, mucosal changes, the use of uh, sedation, antispasmodic mucolytics, systematic mapping, and also sufficient operative time uh, for the uh, procedure, and also the uh, uh, structure chaining, and also the use of the IEE. So I can just summarize um, the process of diagnostic uh, upper endoscopy for early esophageal neoplasia. 
by just a few points. For example, uh, firstly, anatomically localize and clear the observation. So in the esophagus, we might think that it's just a straight tubular structure, but we still need to recognize, uh, as uh, previous speaker mentioned, um, the G junction, um, the squamocolumnar junction, uh, the location of the cricopharynges, and the whether you have a clear wheel. You know, even the bubble can occur in the esophagus as well. Risk assessment, like high risk factor for occurrence of this squamous esophageal neoplasia, like chronic smoker, chronic drinker, and easy facial fascia. I'm one of them. So after drinking, easy facial flushing, chronic smoking and drinking have a higher high risk. History of hand and neck cancer. And then afterwards, we have to detect whether there's any presence of uh, abnormality in the mucosa. And then afterwards, going towards characterization. So how do we make endoscopic diagnosis? If we find any abnormality, firstly, is of course the detection. So uh, when you look into uh, upper endoscopy, uh, during the white light, you may see some mucosal irregularity over here. I typically see uh, young endoscopists claiming that these are just inflammatory condition or esophagitis. But sometimes uh, this is not that uh, simple uh, because uh, a lot of time where when we label uh, esophagitis, uh, some of the endoscopists do not take a biopsy. But if you look into uh, the narrow band imaging image here, so you can see actually a very clear demarcation line over here with a background brownish appearance in the same endoscopic image. Then you would think twice, actually this is a early esophageal neoplasia rather than just a esophagitis. So a um, careful uh, detection process is important. So any area of suspicion, you need uh, to take a, a further look into that area. In the past, we are using chromo endoscopy uh, with a Lugo iodine spray, especially for those who are undergoing surveillance endoscopy or high risk of development of this uh, early esophageal neoplasia. Um, it's operator independent, so that's a good point because uh, you can see this uh, uh, discoloration uh, over the uh, abnormal, abnormal area or unstained area so uh, after the leucochrome endoscopy. But brownish area will be uh, normal but uh, of course um, this, there are other causes of this uh, unstained area. Even the inflammatory condition will give you an unstained area. So it has a low specificity towards uh, esophageal neoplasia. Uh, the patient may develop chest pain and aspiration pneumonitis. So thanks to uh, the development of this image enhanced endoscopy, I think one of the methods is narrow band imaging, which is one of the earliest technology uh, pioneered by um, Dr. Gono from Olympus and also uh, Dr. Sano, uh, from, um, uh, who are renowned endoscopists. And uh, the narrow band imaging narrowed the bandwidth of the light to just 415, 445, and 500 nanometer. So that focused on the mucosal detail observation. So when we are detecting uh, early squamous esophageal neoplasia, we rely very much on the abnormality changes in the vasculature or the IPCL pattern, the intrapapillary capillary loops, and focusing around the uh, brownish color area. And after detecting uh, this uh, abnormal brownish area, we then go on to characterizing this lesion with observation of the IPCL. So IPCL uh, pattern, they are uh, normal vascular capillary loops that runs from branching vessel in the submucosal uh, vessel all the way to uh, the uh, mucosa and they are capillary loops network supplying the blood supply to the mucosa. So these are a normal observation of the uh, IPCL pattern. You can see that for this normal pattern of the loop, sometimes you can see uh, a uh, tail uh, with a normal caliber and the formation of the loop. So all this loop is usually observed in the one direction, uh, in the cluster of one direction. And there are also branching vessel in the base. So uh, very similar to uh, uh, what uh, I've described before, so capillary loops. And uh, 
the uh, sub epithelial capillary networks is uh, usually hard to observe in the low magnification and uh, it's usually needed a high magnification to observe this uh, sub, sub epithelial capillary network and uh, these are the uh, normal and abnormal changes of the IPCL so if you see normal, they are of this kind of caliber. So compare it with the abnormal, where they are dilated and tortuosity over the uh, IPCL pattern. So it's not very difficult to observe under high, uh, magnification. So they're described as dilat dilatation, wavering, caliber change, and also shape uh, change of this IPCL. So. Um, it was uh, reported earlier on uh, by uh, Professor Inoue uh, with uh, the observation in a M1 cancer. The IPCL pet uh, were pretty much much more dilated in terms of the color bar as compared to a normal IPCL pattern. So, uh, as mentioned before, we can label them and describe them into uh, according to different feature including the uh, dilatation, tortuosity, caliber change, and uh, you know, with a different uh, kind of uh, shape, irregular shape of the IPCL. So if you look into this uh, photo, you can see dilated, tortuous waviness of the IPCL pattern. And the caliber change and irregularity will be also correlating with the depth of invasion uh, of this early esophageal neoplasia. So uh, coming from the uh, M1 pattern, uh, M1 invasion, so only uh, irregular change in the loop uh, with dilatation and uh, tortuosity. And when you have M2, you have a slightly more dilated and elongated uh, tail of the IPCL. For M3 invasion, there is a more prominent irregularity and waviness uh, with an elongated irregular uh, loop. And if there is a submucosal invasion, you can see totally irregular uh, pattern, non-loop type, and also maybe some new vessel formation. So this is a very first uh, classification from uh, Professor Inoue uh, for the IPCL pattern. In fact, this classification is quite complicated, divided into type 1, 2, 3, 4, and 5 and 5 also divided into 5, 1, 5, 2, and 5, 3, and 5, N. So this is uh, more correlating to the histopathological uh, finding of this irregular loop pattern. I think uh, what you can uh, observe in here, that the type 1 and 2, there are more uh, inflammatory conditions like esophagitis for type 2. So they are a little bit elongated, but still in the normal caliber. So for um, type 3 and type 4, they are compatible with uh, either a severe esophagitis or low-grade uh, dysplasia. Uh, so you can see, started to see some more prominent and irregular loop. And if there's a waviness, dilated, uh, tortuous loop, then you see it's more correlated with a M1 pattern. So as I mentioned, if you have a dilated and long tail, it's compatible with M2 invasion. Uh, still, on a biopsy, usually it's a high-grade uh, dysplasia or neoplasia. If you have a, a type 5 free pattern, it is uh, more compatible with a early SM1 or M3 pattern. So if you have a totally irregular new vessel formation, it is uh, uh, submucosal invasion. So this is uh, initial classification aiming to correlate with the histopathology and the treatment. But this is probably too complicated. So uh, recently, there's a modification of this classification into just uh, three type. And uh, this is uh, uh, reported again from uh, Professor Inoue. But uh, this, there is an uh, uh, obvious uh, irregular um, uh, uh, dif difference in terms of the uh, caliber size of this pattern comparing the uh, mucosal cancer with the submucosal cancer. So just uh, some example. So this is a normal IPCL, so non-neoplastic. So you can see there are uh, loops, but they are all aligned in the cluster of the same direction with no dilatation, no waviness, no tortuosity. 
there's some borderline the uh, prominency of this uh, vessel but it's still within the normal caliber so but then uh, if you can uh, focus on uh, without the near focus and the, with the near focus we probably see a much better observation of this with the near focus function so this is uh, a um, more a intramucosal uh, cancer you can see that uh, there's a dilated and also tortuous uh, loop appearance so and also we can see a well demarcation around this uh, area of irregular IPCL pattern so this is more compatible with uh, M1 pattern so uh, again the similar observation so dilated uh, tortuous loop so representing a uh, M1 mucosal lesion so when you have this uh, more uh, dilated and uh, waviness and also tortuosity of uh, this uh, IPCL and uh, this is uh, very different from uh, this pattern where you can see you can observe a very irregular uh, no non-loop pattern and also a uh, broad band pattern so this is uh, more representative as a submucosal tumor so again this is also this uh, similar observation so with a irregular new vessel formation of the IPCL this will represent a submucosal invasion so recently also the uh, Japanese uh, esophageal society esophagus society actually um, reported a new classification called the JES um, classification and uh, for this in fact uh, they also uh, dividing this irregular IPCL into um, a loop vessel a non loop vessel pattern and also fake non loop vessel pattern so representing uh, as a B1 B2 and B3 pattern they are also correlating this uh, with uh, the uh, invasion of this tumor so with the loop appearance uh, if you remember just uh, what I explained this is a loop a dilated loop uh, with some tortuosity representing uh, M1 or M2 non-loop pattern uh, may be representing uh, like uh, M3 or SM1 if you see this uh, thick non-loop or brand like uh, totally uh, cannot uh, re recognize any uh, regular IPCL it represents a SM invasion so very similar to uh, what uh, Inoue classification so this is a JES classification so I think uh, the principle is just the same firstly if it is a, a it represents a normal pattern B is abnormal and you have a B1 loop pattern B2 non loop like pattern and B3 highly dilated vessel uh, at the, with a caliber three times larger representing a submucosal invasion and uh, recently we also have uh, introduced introduction of a even higher magnifying uh, endoscopic uh, technology called the endocytoscopy and uh, in the past it was a prop based but uh, over the past 15 years uh, it's been developed into a scope based uh, endocytoscopy where the uh, magnification was built up in the single scope so you can actually observe the lesion all the way from the macroscopic view to the recognition of irregular IPCL to the um, uh, cellular level so um, just a, a simple video to show you uh, how the, this uh, endocytoscope work so you can see um, from this uh, observation under the MBI there's some um, irregular dilated uh, IPCL pattern so uh, when, when we are using this um, endocytoscope uh, one of the difficulty is that uh, we need a very steady hand because uh, usually we don't uh, use uh, a cap because uh, this is a uh, direct uh, contact uh, endoscope so you need uh, directly contact the mucosa before you can observe and under the uh, endocytoscopy so if from what I can observe there is a irregularly dilated uh, IPCL pattern so afterwards I spray um, methylene blue uh, over the mucosa and then afterwards uh, I observe uh, over the uh, mucosa 
um, using the endocytoscopy. Sorry. So, so you can see that um, here there's uh, some um, irregular uh, cellular appearance. So, um, and uh, afterwards, uh, I also stained with uh, crystal violet. So, in combination, this enhances the observation of both the nucleus and also the cytoplasm. And maybe in the background, you can also see some irregular IPCL dilatation as well. So, compared with a normal um, uh, squamous cell, you can see the irregular uh, reverse NC ratio. And uh, with the MBI, you can also see very dilated, uh, tortuous uh, IPCL pattern at the background. So this enhances the observation both from the cellular level and also the uh, uh, the vascular pattern that confirmed this to be a early esophageal neoplasia. So in summary, I think endoscopic detection of uh, early esophageal cancer depends on meticulous observation. IEE improved the detection of this early esophageal cancer while IPCL pattern predicts the histopathological types and also the depth of the invasion. And a training and education is very important to improve the quality of endoscopy for detecting this lesion. Thank you very much. Oh, okay. We're, go we're going straight on. Okay. All right. Okay. So we'll welcome uh, our next speaker, uh, Professor Noria Uedo from Osaka. And again, as John has mentioned, um, the speakers have been introduced before. So without uh, any further delay, we'll just get on to the talk uh, from Professor Uedo on um, how to detect and what should I be doing with gastric atrophy and in intestinal metaplasia. Thank you. Uh, thank you again. So uh, in this topic, I'd like to talk about uh, how to identify or make diagnosis of gastric uh, high-risk condition, mucosal atrophy or intestinal metaplasia by endoscopy, and how to detect uh, dysplasia in the stomach. So this is the background the same. So to uh, make or to detect uh, early gastric cancer efficiently, it is very important to uh, identify, recognize high-risk patients. So there's a, uh, some risk factor uh, associated with the uh, uh, development of gastric cancer, such as male gender, family history, and the ethnic background, such as uh, Japanese, Chinese, or Korean ethnic background. And of course, uh, infection of HPRI is a very important uh, risk factor. Uh, this is a Japanese cohort study. Uh, it shows that uh, gastric cancer is only developed in a HPRI positive patient. So uh, in this number of cohort, uh, development of gastric cancer from HPRI uninfected patient is almost none or close to zero. So uh, usually HPRI infection causes inflammation of the mucosa, gastric mucosa. And then uh, over the time, it causes atrophy of the gastric glands and then develop metaplastic change of gastric mucosa. And eventually, uh, dysplasia or neoplasia is developed on the background of such kind of mucosal changes. And also, uh, so actually, patient with such kind of mucosal, uh, among those with HPR infection, Patient with such kind of mucosal change has a higher risk of development of gastric cancer. For example, uh, if atrophy is severe, uh, about five times uh, higher risk of de development of gastric cancer. And involvement of uh, gastric corpus inflammation can also increase the risk. And uh, of course, presence of intestinal metaplasia uh, can be increased at the risk of gastric cancer. And such kind of mucosal changes is usually or um, usually uh, make diagnosis by histological finding. However, uh, in, especially in Japanese practice, 
we also notice that the mucosal endoscopy finding is also make diagnosis of such kind of high risk mucosal changes. For example, one is a、uh, most uh, popular uh, finding in Japanese endoscopies mucosal atrophy. So,、uh, H. pylori uninfected un、uh, patient, individual,、uh, gastric fold is preserved all around the gastric corpus. And the color, mucosal color, is homogeneously reddish. However, in patient with his,、uh, gastric atrophy, Mucosal fold is lost in the lesser curvature side and the mucosal color is pale. So,、uh, such kind of endoscopy finding has、uh, about 70 to 80% of diagnostic accuracy. And also, intestinal metaplasia can be made diagnosed by endoscopy. So, in the past, in white light image, it is described that the、uh, nodular, nodular whitish patchy. Mucosa is a representative finding of intestinal met- gastric intestinal metaplasia. And、uh, with NBI, it in- enhances the whitish color of the muco- intestinal metaplasia. And it shows about 90% of sensitivity and eight,、uh, 70% of specificity. And、uh, not only、uh, Japanese endoscopy, recently some European group. Also,、uh, propose some ma- make diagnosis of intestinal, gastric intestinal metaplasia by NBI. So, compare to、uh, when we investigate the correlation between histological staging of intestinal metaplasia, NBI shows very good sensitivity or、uh, good accuracy for make diagnosis of intestinal metaplasia compared to. White light image. So, such kind of risk stratification is recently recognized as a important in Japanese population. Because in the past, about 70 or 80% of Japanese population is infected by H. pylori. And then most of the patient has atrophic arthritis. So, all Japanese、eh, population was high risk patient. So, we really recommend and encourage、uh, mass general population screening for all Japanese population. However, H. pylori infection rate is recently decreased to say, 30%. And the patient with ha- some high risk mucosal changes is also dropping. So, that, that kind, such kind of、uh, decrease is not homogeneously、uh, decreased. So, it's almost like a mixture of high risk patient and low risk patient. So, recently, it is important to identify high risk patient and then encourage、uh, surveillance endoscopy to high risk patient. And for low risk patient, maybe not so strong recommendation is necessary for surveillance endoscopy. So,、uh, this is a、uh, uh, Recently published British Society、uh, guideline.、Uh, fortunately, my friend、uh, Takuji Gotoda invited me、uh, as one of the members. So,、uh, in this guideline, so,、uh, patients with high risk mucosal changes、uh, recommended to receive three years annual、uh, three years, uh, surveillance endoscopy every three years. And low risk mucosal Changes, maybe surveillance is not necessary. So,、uh, surveillance interval, there is no strong、uh, high quality、uh, evidence. However, according to some、uh, rep- retrospective study, if the pay,、uh, sc- uh, examination interval exceeds three years,、uh, stage detected gastric cancer stage is increased. And then also、uh, gastric uh, examination, gastroscopy examination s interval increase from increase more than two years. Proportion of endoscopically treated region is declining. And also,、uh, if it is decreased、uh, longer than、uh, two years, 
proportion of advanced gastric cancer increase. So probably most of the guidelines recommend every two to three years、uh, surveillance endoscopy is recommended. So、uh, after that, I want to explain how gastric mucosal changes, high risk mucosal changes looks like. So basically, anatomically, Gastric mucosa has a two different characteristic mucosa. One is antral mucosa, pyloric mucosa, and another is corpus fundic mucosa. So, fundic mucosa is usually has a cylindrical tubular glands like this. So, this is an electromicroscopic image.、Uh, fundic gland looks like this. And it, it has a Round orifice and it is surrounded by mesh network of capillary. So,、uh, this is a white light, magnifying white light image of corpus, normal corpus mucosa. So, in normal corpus mucosa, we can see this kind of spider like collecting venue. This shows the,、uh, about sensitivity of 95, more than 95% of sensitivity of specificity for. H. pyri uninfected、uh, patients. And this is a, a chromoendoscopic magnifying image. You can understand、uh, mu normal corpus mucosa has a round, regular pits like this. And NVI image shows like this. And uh, usually, uh, basically, uh, NVI image e n h a n c e vasculature, surface vasculature as a brownish. Color. So you can see the、uh, mesh network subepithelial capillary that surrounds、uh, corpus gland like this. So this is a, a typical finding of uninfected H. p y r o naive, very low risk、uh, patient with development of gastric cancer. So, how about the、uh, uh, antral mucosa, pyloric mucosa? Pyloric mucosa surface is, looks like a papillary or protruded epithelial pattern. And the gastric gland is a little bit oblique and then branching. So, this is an isolated、uh, mic electron micron image of pyloric gland. So, it has a linear Crypt orifice. So, this is white light magnifying image and the chromoendoscopic image. So, dye is pulled to the such kind of groove among the ridge of the epithelial、uh, ridge or papillae. So, this groove corresponds with the crypt orifice of pyloric mucosa. So, it looks like this. So, group c o r r e s p o n d with a crypt opening, and then、uh, inside of the、uh, epithelial ridge, there is a subepithelial capillary. So, normal corpus has a round orifice and a network of capillary, and、uh, antral mucosa has a ridge like shape, surface,、uh, epithelial surface, and inside there is a coiled、uh, capillary. So, I want to explain with a movie. So, this is a、uh, H. p a r a i uninfected、uh, patient. So, you can see some spider like collecting venue. And with magnification, you can appreciate such kind of regular, regularly arranged round crypt orifice and network capillary which surrounds、uh, epithelium. And this is、uh, antral mucosa. So, in conventional white light image, it looks like the same to corpus mucosa, but with magnifying NBI, mucosal pattern is totally different. We can see some groove like linear crypt orifice, which divides epithelium as a ridge like pattern. And inside, there's a capillary. So basically,、uh, this is corpus mucosa. However, when H. pyri、uh, is infected 
to gastric mucosa. So, and it develop atrophy or intestinal metaplasia, such kind of corpus mucosal pattern change to groove like uh, mucosal pattern, which is similar to antrum. And also, if there is an intestinal metaplasia, we can evaluate or we can observe light reflection of the uh, light reflection on the surface of mucosal ditch like this. We call it a uh, light blue crest sign, which is uh, correspond with the presence of microvilli. Basically, gastric mucosa is secreting uh, epithelium, but uh, if it becomes absorptive mucosa by intestinal metaplasia, it express brush border, microvilli. So this uh, reflect the light, NBI light, and then we can observe such kind of light reflection on the surface of epithelium. So this patient, gastric fold is lost, and the color is a bit whitish. And NBI shows that mucosa has some very similar pattern to uh, antrum, even it is corpus mucosa. And you can observe some light reflection on the surface of epithelium. Like this. So probably most of the doctors think such kind of magnifying image is not so helpful or not so related to your practice. But uh, as I mentioned, if you really understand such kind of anatomical finding and NBI finding, this is a HQ190 image. You can really appreciate regular arranged round pits and the network of capillary. So if you understand the principle and the anatomical finding, you can apply or adapt such kind of knowledge to your practice. So uh, after such kind of identif identification of high-risk patient, it is important to uh, detect early gastric cancer or dysplasia. So to detect dysplastic changes, it is important. Uh, this is already I explained in a previous uh, presentation. Standardized preparation and observation is very important. Of course, uh, such kind of uh, mucus or bubble, we cannot detect small lesion, flat lesion, and the uh, adequate ear insufflation and the standardized observation technique is important. So after understanding or after identification of high-risk patient and performing the standardized observation method, so what kind of finding should be picked up to detect dysplastic change or early neoplasia. So this is also, Philip also mentioned that uh, usually early stage neoplasia has a very subtle changes of morphology or color. So slightly elevated or sometimes totally flat or slightly depressed. That is also important to understand the principle characteristic of finding. If you really understand the principle, you can apply such kind of knowledge to a different method of practice. So principal characteristic of epithelial neoplasia is a one is abnormal growth and another is a adherence of the cancer cells, epithelial neoplastic cells. So usually a normal organ or normal mucosa is organized, uh, growth is organized. However, neoplastic region uh, growth pattern is disorganized. So some part is protruded and some part is depressed. So not round, some part it ex extend too much and uh, some part does not extend. So it represented as a very irregular shape or irregular color like this. And uh, uh, adherence or continuous growth of epithelial neoplasia 
is represented as a clear demarcation line between neoplasia and surrounding mucosa. So, as I mentioned, usually neoplastic tissue is consists of a vasculature and glands. So, irregular or disorganized growth is represented as a irregularly irregular color or irregular morphology. And the adherence or continuous growth is represented as a demarcation line. So, what finding should be picked up? Subtle changes or localized irregularity of color, difference of color of the mucosa, and the uh, uh, surface change, difference of height of mucosa. And uh, sometimes uh, superficial neoplasia has the same morphology and the same color to surrounding mucosa. In such case, loss of vascular pattern of background mucosa or spontaneous bleeding can be a clue to detect such lesion. So, as I mentioned, localized color change and spontaneous bleeding and the localized whitish color change of the mucosa. And the localized slightly elevated area or localized slightly depressed area can be a clue to uh, suspect superficial neoplasia. And if it is very flat and the same color, sometimes disappearance of background mucosal network can be a, a clue to suspect a superficial neoplasia. And also, there is a shallow erosion, but the surrounding mucosa shows some a, spontaneous bleeding. So this kind of finding can be a, a chance to suspect a, extension of the lesion like this. So uh, th these are finding of white light image to detect early gastric cancer. So one clinical question is that uh, recently uh, NBI is introduced into our practice. So such kind of uh, image enhanced technology can improve gastric cancer detection. So uh, recently we have uh, conducted the uh, random multicenter study. So in this case, we have enrolled about uh, 4,000 cases total. And uh, we expected to uh, NBI to detect more early gastric cancer patients. But the uh, actual uh, outcome was different. So white light detect 2%, and the NBI detected 2.3%. And there is no statistical significance. So Probably this result uh, suggests uh, maybe still standard method to detect early gastric cancer is white light image. Probably you can use NBI, but uh, there is no uh, significant advantage. So detection, NBI is uh, not, not significant, but uh, for characterization, as I mentioned, uh, NBI magnification is very useful. We can really directly evaluate irregularity of vasculature and the irregularity of surface structure and the presence of demarcation line in endoscopic image like this. So for this uh, evaluation of characterization, we also conducted the multicenter study so uh, we enrolled 1,300 patients and detected uh, three small depressed region in 360 patients. And then we compare the diagnostic accuracy of white light image and NBI in these patients. So we found that the uh, uh, white light image plus NBI significantly improved the diagnostic, diagnostic accuracy of early gastric cancer, like this. I just show some uh, example. So there is a small depression here. So only a uh, white light image, it's very difficult to say whether it is neoplasia or non-neoplasia. And you can see some changes of mucosa of suggesting intestinal metaplasia, like this. 
and this is a depressed area and the mucosal pattern is disappeared so there is a demarcation line and then inside of the demarcation line we can evaluate irregular presence of irregular microvessels so we can make diagnosis this small depression is a neoplastic area by endoscopic image so uh, this is a, a guideline how to deal with dysplasia so non-visible low-grade dysplasia annual uh, systemic endoscopy is encouraged and uh, three consecutive non-dysplastic finding uh, after that three uh, con uh, conventional surveillance is recommended so non-visible high-grade dysplasia every uh, systematic endoscopy with image enhancement is recommended for every six months and a visible high or low grade dysplasia endoscopy resection is recommended uh, at last uh, philip showed that uh, uh, recently developed high magnification ultra high magnification endoscopy and uh, this is originally designed as a contact uh, observation but uh, uh, recently we uh, usually i use it with black hood so we found that uh, uh, with black cap we can achieve very ultra high magnification image of gastric mucosa with this uh, endo uh, with this scope so just want to share how gastric mucosa looks like so this is a probably almost the same uh, magnification level to conventional NBI, but uh, we can increase the magnification power to almost five times, 500 times. So this is a contact observation. But uh, if we use a cap and then make some space between lens and the mucosa, we can evaluate epithelial structure or cellular structure inside of the epithelium like this so this is non-metaplastic antral mucosa so cellular structure arrange very regularly like this and uh, and this is intest gastric intestinal metaplasia. So gastric intestinal metaplasia. In inside cellular structure is a bit heterogeneous. And we can observe light blue crest sign on the surface of gastric intestinal metaplasia like this. So uh, this is a non-metaplastic mucosa, so mucosa edge is very smooth and the cellular structure is very homogeneous. Whereas the intestinal metaplasia, uh, cellular structure is very heterogeneous and the edge of the epithelium is very bit irregular, rough irregular. So non-metaplastic mucosa and metaplastic mucosa. So such kind of difference of heterogeneity and the edge of is, uh, can be observed like this. So probably uh, cellular structure or mucin is regular in non-metaplastic mucosa and the edge is very smooth. However, intestinal metaplasia, uh, cellular structure is very heterogeneous and the edge is very rough like this. So uh, we can observe such kind of histological difference in endoscopic image. So anyway, in summary, identification of high-risk patients in, is important to improve detection of early gastric cancer. Standardized preparation and the observation method is important to detect abnormal mucosal finding. And the understanding of characteristic finding is important. And image-enhanced endoscopy helps 
Further characterization of detected region. Thank you very much for kind attention. We're moving straight on. So um, now we have the tandem talk of two perspectives by our two experts. Um, how do we manage early gastric cancer and, uh, and early squamous cell carcinoma? It's going to be a tag team, I think. <laughs> okay. Yes, thank you. So um, just follow on my previous uh, talk and then the, go on to the endoscopic management of uh, early esophageal neoplasia. Uh, I think uh, in principle, I think we are really much very similar. So uh, for management of uh, early GI neoplasia, including esophageal cancer. So the option is if there's uh, minimal risk of lymphoma metastasis, then we can offer a local treatment. So EML, ESD, if there is a high, it's, if it's a local regional disease with a high risk of lymphoma metastasis, then we are treating them with esophagectomy. For me, it's a thoracoscopic or minimal invasive esophagectomy. So uh, then we have to understand uh, the, the, the risk of having a lymphoma metastasis uh, with a different uh, penetration of uh, the esophageal neoplasia. Uh, starting, uh, this is uh, actually a Japanese treatment guideline for esophageal cancer. So if there is, a, generally speaking, a mucosal lesion, including M1, M2, and M3, with a minimal risk of nodal metastasis, then we can treat it by standard uh, endoscopic resection. If there is a submucosal invasion, in, in particular in the squamous cell esophageal cancer, it actually amounts to a much higher risk of lymphoma metastasis and then we have to consider treating them by uh, esophagectomy. The advantage of endoscopic resection, of course, uh, I think everybody knows, is a locally curative intent treatment. We can preserve the organ so the patient have a better uh, post-operative quality of life and uh, with a better function and a better post-operative recovery and outcome. Uh, and uh, endoscopic resection started uh, with uh, the development of uh, polypectomy and then the, in the upper GI is uh, developed into the endoscopic mucosal resection. And then there are different techniques like uh, uh, with a creation of a pseudopolyp. Uh, after uh, some mucosal injection, you can use uh, a cap EMR technique, as you can see here. And uh, you can also use a strip biopsy technique and also the application of a, a band uh, before a EMR. So we recognize, uh, so this is uh, one of the um, so video that we share uh, on the MPEG group um, that uh, uh, with an early esophageal neoplasia, as you can see after a leucrochromo endoscopy, um, we can identify the lesion and mark around the lesion. And afterwards uh, applied a um, some mucosal injection to elevate and create a, uh, like a pseudopolyp. So and afterwards uh, we applied um, a band. In this case, a uh, is a duet uh, a device, suction and uh, ligation. Apply a band of beneath. So af and afterwards applied um, the uh, snare to resect uh, this part of the lesion. I think uh, this technique uh, is nice uh, for a small lesion, uh, but uh, if it is a uh, typical uh, early esophageal cancer of uh, bigger than uh, two centimeter in size, it's very really difficult uh, to just uh, resect this lesion on block by this technique. And uh, this is a one of the um, study reported uh, from Japanese uh, colleague. 116 consecutive patients uh, who receive a EMR. Uh, the uh, local uh, recurrence is defined by uh, the neoplasia detect at the EMR site. Uh, the, um, <clears throat> actually, most of these uh, were resected by strip biopsy technique, and the local recurrence rate is actually 20%. So 
uh, I think very importantly, uh, on block recession is one of the important concepts uh, that we are now having, uh, especially for uh, screamers esophageal neoplasia. Uh, risk of uh, local recurrence is in fact uh, high if we are not resecting it by uh, on block resection. Uh, so the application of the ESD technique allow us to have uh, on block resection with a wide margin, also a better specimen for histopathology. Uh, then, but then in the esophagus is uh, a little bit harder to perform the ESD uh, because of the limited space for manipulation. We have a different kind of uh, ESD device nowadays, uh, and. Uh, I generally classify them into either a insulated type or non-insulated type, and uh, the list is uh, ever going on. There's a new device coming up uh, all the time, but I think uh, the very important issue is uh, whether you can master the use of these uh, devices and you understand uh, how we perform uh, all these uh, by different devices and the technique of handling this. And uh, also, I think the energy platform is important for us to perform the ESD uh, in the esophagus. So uh, I generally use um, endocut uh, Q mode uh, with uh, effect 2, cut duration 2, and cut interval 2. And uh, during the submucosal dissection, I use a strict coagulation mode. While for hemostasis, I use the soft coagulation mode. And also, I think a submucosal injection solution is important uh, because when we are doing the ESD, it would require us to have a longer period of time and we need a clear observation of the submucosa uh, after creation of a good uh, submucosal cushion. So for me, I generally use uh, normal saline in combination with epinephrine and indigocarmine and I add a high molecular weight compound into that so that the submucosal cushion can be maintained in a longer period of time. Uh, generally speaking, we are using the, sod uh, the sodium hyaluronic uh, so the hyaluronic acid. So uh, I know that in Japan uh, you have the milko up. For Hong Kong we don't have the milko up. Uh, we are using the Korean uh, type of uh, hyaluronic hyaluron acid and added to that. So just uh, show you a uh, video about um, the um, performance of esophageal ESD. So again, first uh, is to, uh, to have a clear observation and confirm the indication location of the lesion and also the margin. So if you can see in this uh, case, we can actually see very clearly with the uh, narrow band imaging and with a magnification uh, near focus function, we can see the margin of uh, the uh, lesion. And then we uh, mark around uh, the margin. So typically I mark uh, with um, the uh, dual knife. Uh, that's the commonest device that I use now for esophageal ESD. And I typically mark uh, around uh, 1 mm uh, 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 over the uh, margin and then I have to take all these uh, markings away so typically I think we have a uh, um, resection margin of 1, one to 2 mm so after the uh, marking we inject the submucosal uh, uh, solution as I mentioned it's a mixture of uh, normal saline uh, indigo carmine and also the uh, hyaluronic acid and uh, then after that uh, we will dissect around uh, the lesion so uh, in the next video I can show you the different technique but uh, in this video I do a typical uh, ESD so doing a circumferential mucosal incision and then afterwards uh, perform the submucosal dissection so now there's a modification of this technique as well uh, with the uh, concept of a tunneling actually you can do tunneling for this uh, ESD technique but very importantly I think uh, the the margin is uh, very important in the ESD so and also the recognition of um, the submucosal cushion and to avoid complication like a, a perforation by recognizing the muscularis propria layer is also very important so as I'm mentioned I used the uh, strict coagulation mode during the submucosal dissection. The main reason is uh, to avoid uh, uh, significant bleeding because uh, bleeding can uh, obscure the wheel of the dissection. Uh, when we are uh, doing the ESD one of the observation is that uh, whether you need a circumferential ESD or not. So if um, the esophageal uh, 
uh, lesion required a circumferential uh, uh, ESD, then the chance of uh, stricture formation is really, really very high. But uh, also it depends because uh, if the lesion by nature require a circumferential resection, then you have no choice. Otherwise, uh, it end up in a local recurrence and the management is even more difficult. So um, the current uh, device uh, with this um, uh, dual knife, actually uh, you can have a uh, injection function so you can continuously inject. So that uh, help a lot. Uh, I typically do this uh, esophageal ESD under general anesthesia at the endoscopy suite. Uh, one of the reasons that I want the GA is because I worry uh, aspiration pneumonia. So the the um, uh, the hood the uh, uh, the distal attachment that I have is uh, just a soft cap. There are different kind of uh, cap that you can use. Uh, so I think afterwards it's just a repeated uh, procedure. So the final part, uh, sometimes I also used um, the uh, IT Nano knife, uh, which helped me to uh, dissect, especially at the very end of the, um, the ESD procedure. So the most difficult part uh, for me now is uh, uh, when we are finishing the procedure. So sometimes we cannot be uh, uh, be able to see um, the submucosa very well because um, the most of the lesion is being uh, dissected so the uh, mucosa is being uh, flipping away so a lot of time i use um, the it nano to complete um, the final dissection okay so this is the final part and i grab um, the lesion and then afterwards uh, we need a meticulous uh, coagulation using the uh, coag grasper so i typically use the 4mm uh, there are different kinds but this is a smaller jaw so focusing on the uh, smaller vessel in the esophagus. So you can see I still have a strip of uh, normal mucosa. And the pinning of the, the uh, specimen into the board is also important for um, histopathology. And I also use the MBI to observe and confirm that uh, the margin is clear. So uh, specimen handling is important after the uh, procedure. So um, And uh, with a dedicated pathologist, examining the specimen is also important. Uh, and then the post-ESD management, we need to recognize um, the risk of uh, lymph node metastasis upon uh, the histopathological report and uh, manage the patient according to the outcome of the pathology. Uh, I typically give uh, PPI. Uh, in general, it's an IV dose for 48 hours and then change to oral. Uh, this is uh, not a must. I think uh, in the guideline, there's no such kind of uh, recommendation but it's just uh, my practice starting very early uh, so i still use ppi and then the the uh, prevention of stricture formation is probably more more important uh, it occur almost like in all case of circumferential esophageal esd so if that happened i usually routinely do weekly endoscopic examination plus or minus pneumatic dilatation starting from the second week until the resolution of the stricture. Uh, and uh, recently, there's also the uh, use of either local injection or oral steroid therapy to avoid a stricture formation. And I conduct annual surveillance uh, IEE endoscopy for these lesions, uh, for, for this patient. So I think uh, for esophageal ESD outcome, they are reported worldwide uh, from different uh, center. Uh, the r naught resection rate is actually varies from 80 to 100%. Um, the uh, local recurrence rate is in fact quite low. Common complication including stenosis, bleeding, uh, perforation, and emphysema. And uh, this is a systematic review of about the uh, endoscopic uh, and surgical resection outcome for T1A and T1B esophageal neoplasia. So if you look into the uh, EMR against uh, ESD, uh, you can see similar resection margins. ESD has a higher rate of stricture, while EMR has a higher rate of number of piecemeal resection and also the local recurrence. Uh, and uh, also when you compare SCC versus adenocarcinoma, SCC has a higher positive rate of uh, lymph node uh, in the surgical group. So this is one of the major differences that we are really uh, more cautious for managing uh, squamous cell carcinoma. 
And uh, if you look into the long-term outcome of ESD for treatment of this superficial esophageal neoplasia, so um, this is one of the reports uh, from Japan. Uh, out of uh, 84 patients, 15 required more treatment, including chemo radiation in six and the surgery in nine. Uh, the uh, syn synchronous tumor occurrence rate is uh, 20% in these patients. So you need any uh, IEE endoscopy for follow-up. And uh, the, if you look into um, the survival rate, so group A is high-grade intraepithelial neoplasia to M2, while uh, group B is uh, M3 or SM. So you can see the uh, overall survival rate of five years is in fact quite good. For group A, it's 100%. For group B, it's still 95%. But uh, disease-specific survival for group B is uh, much, much lower because of um, the uh, occurrence of the M3 or SM, which has a higher chance of nodal metastasis. So this is another report from Korean uh, group. So um, you can see again the uh, survival five year is uh, quite good. Uh, for uh, M1 is uh, eighty percent, for SM is seventy nine percent. And uh, the other issue that uh, we encounter in the esophageal ESD is the uh, occurrence of the complication. Bleeding for immediate, in, immediate during procedure uh, bleeding usually is not very profuse bleeding. You can be controlled by uh, ESD instrument or uh, the correct grasper. Delayed bleeding is in fact very uncommon, it occur less than 1%. Uh, perforation is more significant complication in generally, it occurs in 3 to 5%, mostly detected during the procedure and uh, you can manage it by just a clip uh, closure. And of course, a stricture formation. As I mentioned, it occur uh, in uh, uh, when you have a more circumferential extension. This is one of the study showing that if there is a circumferential extension more than uh, three quarters of uh, the circumference, or even a completely uh, circumferential, then the stricture occurrence rate is really, really high. So, uh, as I mentioned before, the how to manage this, uh, you know, prevention is very important. So, weekly endoscopic dilatation, uh, anti-inflammatory approach like your use of a steroid, and in the probably in the future with uh, more clinical trial coming out, then you can uh, also think about tissue engineering approach uh, that uh, you know I think a Japanese colleague is developing using a scalpel-based therapy or even a cell-based therapy to prevent stricture formation. So strategy to avoid ESD complication, I think choose the right case is important. So uh, when you are starting only performing the ESD, please start with a smaller lesion with a good location. Avoid lesion with scarring, like uh, previous multiple biopsies or even previous EMR treatment. Training is also important with a good background experience as standardized training course, starting with ex vivo and animal model and then followed by a proctorship program. Instrument selection, uh, select the best instrument that you are familiar with and also the site and the location. For example, you probably should start the few, first uh, few case um, uh, and also continue with the large case of ESD under uh, the GA, uh, the GA uh, facilities. So, and then coming up with uh, the final part of managing incomplete resection or recurrence. So, as uh, I mentioned, uh, when you look into the pathology, then the, the outcome in general will be that uh, for um, mucosal lesion, then the, they are having a minimal risk of nodal metastasis. Then for M1, M2, you're probably very sure that they will not have uh, have chance of nymphal metastasis that can be treated by ESD or EMR. For uh, M3, still a low risk, so we can just monitor. But for SM, starting from SM1, we are really worried about uh, the nodal metastasis. So um, this is uh, one of the uh, study uh, reporting uh, the risk of nodal metastasis. Uh, uh, it's a systematic review of 105 papers recruiting uh, 7,600 patients. You can see that uh, the uh, no positive rate uh, for SM1 is 27%, SM2 is uh, 38%, SM3 is uh, 54%.
Uh, and uh, in general, we do not encounter SM2, SM3 after endoscopic resection because we already recognize that uh, by the feature that I described from the IPCL pattern. So they generally will be support, uh, submitted to other treatment like esophagectomy or chemo radiation therapy. But for SM1, sometimes we find it under uh, the histopathological examination after ESD. And as I mentioned, the total uh, risk of nodal metastasis may be up to 27%. So we are also observing other risk factors like uh, lymphovascular permeation, tumor grade, and size. And the management can be salvage esophagectomy with a minimally inv invasive approach or uh, adjuvant chemoradiation therapy. I think uh, Japanese is uh, doing a randomized study up on, on this. Uh, I think uh, they will have an outcome probably very soon or already reported. Not yet, okay. We are waiting for that. But uh, I think in summary, ESD achieved a high curative on block resection for early esophageal cancer. So uh, squamous cell carcinoma um, after non-curative endoscopic resection should be generally treated by esophagectomy. Uh, ESD achieved an excellent long-term outcome and uh, with a low risk of local recurrence and long-term surveillance is important to detect for metachronous tumor. Thank you very much. Okay, so then <clears throat> I will talk about the uh, uh, management of early gastric cancer, but I mainly uh, summarize for the uh, pretreatment staging because I thought it is more like a diagnostic imaging course. But so if you have any question for the real uh, treatment, endoscopy treatment or management or complication, maybe you can ask me uh, a question later. So uh, as I mentioned, visible high-grade dysplasia or low-grade dysplasia or early gastric cancer is an indication of endoscopic resection. However, this is a, a Japanese treatment guideline. So we have to uh, exclude uh, nodal metastasis, of course, and also we have to uh, exclude some mucosal invasive cancer. And the intramucosal cancer can be an uh, indication for endoscopy resection. So actually this is, a uh, uh, George already uh, showed these slides, but uh, basically before treatment, endoscopy management is not only resection technique, but also pre-treatment staging, and also post-treatment evaluation of histological finding is also very important. But anyway, to decide whether to perform or not to perform endoscopy resection, it is important to decide the indication according to endoscopy finding. So what kind of finding is important to decide indication? One is histological type and the uh, size of the region. And of course, depth of tumor invasion. Indication is only for uh, intramucosal region. And the presence or uh, absence of ulcer scar. So I want to uh, explain. And after that, uh, we evaluate curativity according to histological finding. But anyway, uh, to decide whether to perform or not to perform uh, endoscopy resection, endoscopic assessment is very important. So how we can evaluate or estimate or histological type of early gastric cancer? Uh, as you know, usually uh, gastric cancer has uh, two different uh, histological type, differentiated type and undifferentiated type, uh, refer to intestinal type or diffuse type in Western criteria classification. So uh, this is very simple but a uh, useful finding. So we evaluated 340 uh, early gastric cancer patients. So if the region is elevated type, specificity is 99% for uh, differentiated type adenocarcinoma. So not only uh, many enhanced imaging technique or something, just evaluate morphological finding can very good uh, accurate accuracy 
for histological type of gas,、uh, early gastric cancer. And how about、uh, depressed type gastric cancer? Color can be associated with the histological type of gastric cancer. Differentiated type cancer、uh, usually shows reddish color. However, undifferentiated type cancer shows more whitish color. So, very simple. If it is elevated, 99% is differentiated. And the depressed, reddish color indicate differentiated type. And the whitish color indicate undifferentiated type. So,、uh, for example, this is a, a reddish depressed allegacy cancer. And this is whitish、uh, undifferentiated type gastric cancer. Probably,、uh, Differentiated type cancer creates gland structure and it is surrounded by capillary or dilated capillary according to tumor、uh, structure. So, probably such kind of dilated capillary m a k e the region reddish. However, undifferentiated type does not create such kind of、uh, capillary. So, only、uh, coil like corkscrew like Irregular vessel is seen. So, probably less vessel vasculature can show、uh, associated with the、uh, color of the structure. But anyway,、uh, similar to gastric mucosa, gland structure is surrounded by network of capillary. So, if the vessel c r e a t e network pattern,、uh, it's more likely to be differentiated type. However, there is no network. Formation, it is more likely to be undifferentiated type. So, morphological type and color and the vasculature in magnifying NBI, we can estimate the,、uh, depth of, uh, estimate the histological type. Probably, of course, we have to、uh, confirm it by biopsy, histological finding on biopsy. But a such kind of endoscopic finding can be increase the diagnostic accuracy of,、uh, of biopsy by targeted、uh, according to endoscopic images. Target biopsy according to endoscopic images. So then、uh, we have to、uh, decide the size because the、uh, undifferentiated type region is smaller than,、uh, larger than 2 cm. It is not the indication of endoscopic resection. And the region has a、uh, ulcer scar.、Uh, region larger than 3 cm is also not the indication for、uh, endoscopic resection. So it is important to determine the extent of the region. So,、uh, standard, in the past, standard method to determine the、uh, boundary of the tumor was chromoendoscopy in Japan. But recently,、uh, we can use magnifying NBI. So, we evaluate, compare the diagnostic accuracy of both methods. We really expected、uh, magnifying NBI is superior to chromoendoscopy and then enroll 380 patients. But the actual diagnostic accuracy was almost similar between the two groups. So, probably if The、uh, doctor does not have a magnifying endoscopy. If you use indigo carmine chromoendoscopy, you can achieve almost a similar outcome to diagnosis of extent of the、uh, early gastric cancer. So,、uh, as I mentioned,、uh, usually、uh, size is whether to perform or not to perform.、Uh, Endoscopy resection, but、uh, after the endos、uh, endoscopy resection, we have to evaluate the size of the region by histology. Because the region exceeds、uh, 3 cm or two,、uh, in differentiated type with scar, or、uh, if the region exceeds 2 cm in undifferentiated type, there is a small risk of chance of nodal metastasis. So, this kind of、uh, patient is an indication for additional、uh, adjuvant surgery. So, to measure the size of、uh, region in histology, we measure it in a、uh, histological specimen. So, this is a、uh, usual practice in Japan. After that, 
We cut the specimen into every two millimeter and then take the picture with scale and then mapping the extent of the region onto the photography and then measure the size according to uh, compare to the scale. So I think such kind of very careful evaluation in histology is also important to justify the resection, endoscopic resection of early gastric cancer. So actually this is a, a one systematic review for a lymph node metastasis rate of early gastric cancer. So expanded indication such as uh, ALSA or uh, three less than three centimeter presence of ALSA scar, uh, this kind of uh, region without ALSA scar and two centimeter, more than two centimeter, such kind of region, uh, lymph node metastasis is very low. Even we have conducted the systematic review. However, region uh, smaller than uh, two centimeter, undifferentiated type or expanded indication, minute uh, submucosal invasion, lymph node metastasis rate is a bit higher compared to uh, other expanded indication region. And especially when we look at the uh, uh, reported country, Japanese report always show almost 0%. However, non-Japanese report uh, always show higher lymph node metastasis rate. So probably in Japan, uh, especially uh, endoscopic resected specimen, every two or three centimeter interval cut and the evaluation of whole specimen is recommended. However, if it is very roughly cut and roughly evaluated, some part of some mucosal invasion or lymphovascular involvement can be missed or understaged. Probably such kind of uh, careful examination may associated with such kind of difference of risk of lymph node metastasis. So I think very important to evaluate, carefully evaluate histological finding of resective specimen. And uh, at last, I want to uh, explain about the how to uh, estimate the depth of tumor invasion. Uh, one simple thing is a uh, uh, morphological type. It's a bit difficult to estimate elevated or depressed by uh, estimate the depth of tumor Im invasion by elevation or depression. However, one thing is a totally flat lesion, 80% is intramucosal. And uh, uh, of course, EUS is also uh, good to use it for estimation of death. But uh, this is a retrospective study from Korea, but uh, it, also, uh, it shows that the uh, conventional endoscopic finding, such as smooth surface or shallow morphological changes, or very obvious uh, changes for some mucosal invasive cancer, such kind of endoscopic finding is it's a retrospective study, but uh, better than US staging. And uh, recently, one interesting uh, finding is reported for estimation of depth of tumor invasion. So in this uh, finding, uh, intramucosal cancer, when we inflate and distend the gastric mucosa or uh, gastric lumen, intramucosal cancer become totally flat uh, because there is no this because the region is confined to the mucosa. However, if we inflate the submucosal cancer uh, like this, so submucosal invasive tissue lift the uh, region into, protruded into the lumen, lifting the surrounding mucosa like this. So most important thing is that uh, it is important to evaluate the uh, finding with enough insufflation of the air. But uh, uh, this kind of finding can be reported that, that they can uh, estimate, make diagnosis of depth of invasion with very good sensitivity and specificity. 
But of course, this is retrospective study. So、uh, we are now conducting a prospective validation study with a MARS center. So at last,、uh, I just want to show、uh, the method procedure of Gasric ESD. So this is really close to the、uh, Caldia. And、uh, with, we can notice that the very protruded area, but the region has some slight flat extension. But、uh, such kind of demarcation can be、uh, determined by irregularity of vessel. And、uh, we put marking, and then make mucosal incision surrounding the region. And this is whitish, is a muscle, and、uh, some mucosa is transparent. So we dissect、uh, in between the some mucosa and surface of muscularis propria. And sometimes we can see some, some mucosal vessels. And if you identify the vessel, you can coagulate the vessel to avoid oozing, bleeding. This. And if we continue、uh, this kind of uh, procedure, uh, we can、uh, completely remove such kind of lesion like this.、Uh, recently, a long term、uh, good outcome is reported in a, a prospective cohort study for expanded indication lesion, which shows a five year survival is 97% of the、uh, about 470 patients. And、uh, this is the、uh, actual number of gastric ESD performed in Japan. So it is accepted in 2006. And、uh, 2013,、uh, all around Japan, 40, more than 40,000 ESD is performed. And、uh, our statistics show that the、uh, uh, incidence of gastric cancer is、uh, 120,000. So in Japan now, Almost one third of gastric cancer is、uh, treated by endoscopy resection. So,、uh, histological type, morphology, and color can be estimated, or magnifying NBI finding is also helpful. And、uh, for, to determine the extent of the tumor, chrome endoscopy or magnification NBI is useful. And a non extension sign and、uh, enough insufflation is useful sign. To, to、uh, estimate the depth of tumor invasion. And careful histological evaluation is important to justify the resection of a gastric cancer. Thank you very much. Thanks. Are you moving on to the putting the expert on the spot? Yeah, so, yeah, so we'll do that. Questions? And yeah, we'll take questions from, from the audience. And、uh, we've got a few sort of、uh, text questions which I'll put forth. Sure. Just a, just a note before anyone puts their hand up.、I'm, it always、uh, leaves me in awe hearing speakers like yourselves. It makes me feel like we're not a third world. We're, 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 we're far from a first world country in Australia in comparison to management of. Of early squamous cell carcinoma and early gastric cancer. Thank you very much for your very informative talks. It'll be interesting to see,、um, Raj, do you know how many ESDs were done for gastric,、uh, early gastric cancer in Australia last year?、Um, I think it'll be less than 100. Yeah, less yeah. than 100 in comparison to 42,000. I mean,、yeah. that's,、uh, and our early gastric cancer rates,、uh, I think, for, for resections, it's, it's less than 5% of resections. In Australia, are done for, whereas a third of your early gastric cancer is managed endoscopically, which is,、yeah. is really quite awe inspiring. Thank you very much for your very informative talk. So, so we're open to discussion and, and questions from anybody. So, there, there are a couple of、uh, text questions.、Um, so, I, I think this、uh, can be directed to both、uh, Philip and Noria.、Uh, what surveillance、uh, do you recommend for? Uh, gastric intestinal metaplasia. What, what would you do? So, we need a roving mic if we can. So, in Japanese uh, guideline, uh, British or European guideline always suggest、uh, th three 
エブリスリーヤーズ、えー、エンドスコープサーベランスエンドスコープをエブリスリーヤーズアンダージャパニーズガイドラインズリコメンエブリトゥイヤーズでリコ、えー、リリコグナイズプロバブリー、えー、リスクイズハイヤーインジャパニーズポピュレーションオエスニスティ、yeah. I, I think it also depends、uh, as Noria was mentioning about the extent of the, the IM、ah, yes. so if it's just limited to either the corpus or the antrum Um, and if the patients do not have any family history of gastric cancer,、um, th- we may just、uh, decide not to survey them. In contrast, if there's span sort of、uh, gastric atrophy or IM, then the surveillance interval is two to three years.、Uh, actually, the、uh, European gand- guideline、uh, yes. you know, differentiates such kind of、uh, antral limited. Intestinal metaplasia, but the、uh, Japanese guide- guidelines do not、They're、distinguish. Not.、Yes. Yeah. So they recommend just、uh, you know, every two year surveillance for high risk patients. And, and what about incomplete intestinal metaplasia? Is、uh, there such is, an entity? Or、uh, that is also、do? still not a very high level of evidence. So、okay. we, ju- we don't、uh, distinguish complete or incomplete. Just、yeah. the presence or extent of intestinal beta p l a s i a is more important associated with the risk of gastric cancer, I think. Okay,、uh, there's a question for Philip.、Uh, has there been any published advances in utilizing AI for esophageal squamous dysplasia? Yeah, I, I, I recognize some paper about、um, the development of AI protocol for、uh, squamous esophageal dysplasia.、Uh, I think、uh, it's basing on the、uh, Uh, IPCL pattern mostly on the characterization. In fact,、um, for detection, I don't think、uh, I don't see any. But uh, now uh, we also have、um, the AI protocol for upper GI. I think there are several、um, software, and the development uh, uh, the targets are both on standardization of the endoscopic quality and the procedure, and also on the detection and characterization. I think, in general speaking, so. As、uh, Noria pointed out, I think、uh, in performance of the endoscopy, the、um, quality and the standardization of upper GI endoscopy is less well known as compared to the lower GI because,、um, in general, there are you know, poly detection rate, adenoma detection rate, but for upper GI, there's none. I think this is very important for us to have a complete、uh, high quality endoscopic examination before we go on to、uh, you know, detection and characterization. Yes. Uh, one, one for Noria.、Uh, what is the follow up required for autoimmune gastritis in view of the high risk of gastric cancer?、Uh, difficult question. I, <laughs> especially、uh, e s p e c i a l l y Japanese、uh, population, incidence of autoimmune gastritis is not so high. And, uh, but uh, uh, European uh, population s a y that uh, it's uh, also one of the risk factors for development of gastric cancer. But I guess. Uh, compared to H. pyra associated gastritis, risk is a bit lower. And、uh, they develop a、uh, net, but、uh, not so many gastric cancer, in my observation or understanding. So, the, the, this is another question. Perhaps you would have answered it before, Noria.、Uh, on whom do you perform the Sydney protocol biopsies?、Um, only those for whom you have detected lesions endoscopically? Or for certain high risk patients?、Mm. So that is also. I、uh, wrote some review paper with a、uh, Portuguese doctor, but、uh, basically, Japanese practice, we more rely on endoscopic finding, presence of intestinal metaplasia, endoscopic finding of intestinal metaplasia, or、uh, gastric atrophy, atrophic mucosa. So in Japanese practice, Sydney pro,、uh, random biopsy is very rare.、Okay. So. I, I've got one for you.、Uh-huh. So, you nicely showed a, a white light、um, differentiation、mm-hmm. with slightly redder lesions、uh, demarcating differentiated cancers、mm-hmm. and more whitish lesions signifying Undefined,、yeah. undifferentiated cancers.、Mm-hmm. How would you make out gastritis, gastritis like patches from? Um, early cancer. So、uh, they also look red. Yes.、Uh, so sometimes only, only white light image, bit dif- sometimes a bit difficult to、uh, distinguish. But、uh, basically, usually such kind of、uh, inflammatory change is multiplied. 
and the almost similar distribution to、uh, anterior wall side or posterior wall side. But、uh, usually, neoplasia is a bit larger than the others, and the different shape, a bit irregular shape, or redder, or a bit whiter, or something. I think such kind of multiplicity or something is useful finding. Or if you are、uh, a bit not so confident, mag magnifying NPI is very useful. Yes. And a n d r e w has a question. Yep,、um, Professor、uh, Wado.、Um, so, just regarding biopsies again for gastric IM. So,、mm -hmm. endoscopically, if you, if you feel there is gastric IM、mm -hmm. on endoscopic basis, do you then take biopsies or do you just look visually for any dysplastic areas?、Uh, in Japanese practice, we don't take biopsy. At all? Okay. At all. So, <laughs> you would then,、uh, so you, if you don't see any dysplastic areas, you would bring them back in two years? Yes. Yeah. And if you do see something suspicious, would suspicious. you then biopsy or would you just evaluate、uh, an ESD? If it is、uh, suspicious, with,、uh, but before ESD, we always confirm with histology.、Yes. Thank you. Okay.、Um, we'll, we'll do some, some cases while we wait for more、uh, questions、um, and then we can take things from there.、Um, I think we have,、uh, we have not touched on gastric polyps.、Um, and, and I've lined up a few cases and、uh, just to、uh, sort of、uh, get our panel of experts. Can we put up the slides here? So,、uh, this, this is a polyp、um, <coughs> in the、um, lower part of the body of the stomach. I'd just like、uh, to ask、uh, Philip and Noria. Firstly, what is the. We know the most common types of polyps are the、uh, fundic cystic polyps, right? They, they form probably 75 to 80 percent of all gastric polyps, and especially in、uh, probably the Western population,、uh, given that a lot of people are using PPIs, we actually tend to see them quite often, okay? So I'm not saying this is a fundic cystic polyp. But I'm trying to ask you if you do see one, how, you do, how do you identify a、uh, fundic cystic polyp? And、uh, what would you do? Would you biopsy these polyps or would you just leave it alone, ignore it, just carry on with your endoscopy? So, fundic, incidental findings. Fundic gland polyp is、uh, basically a benign lesion. So,、uh, So, very typical finding,、uh, like a very smooth and a shiny surface and a very regular round shape,、uh, we don't take biopsy at all, just follow up. How about you, Philip? Yeah,、uh, very similar. So,、uh, basically, the concept is、uh, totally benign、uh, and、uh, with observation, and、uh, you know, under MBI, there would be some uh, regular um, microstructural uh, pattern. and、uh, So,、uh, I would、uh, actually take a、uh, few large size polyp just for sampling, and、uh, then afterwards I can comfort the patient, explain that this is a fundic gland polyp, and、uh, not to worry too much about it. So, because、uh, most of the time we see multiple polyps, we can't take it all in one、yes. go. Yeah, I think the、uh, present、so、recommendation is that you may want to elect to sample some of the polyps which are beyond five millimeters in size. If they're more than one centimeter, perhaps resect them because there's about a two to three percent risk of dysplasia in some of these more larger fundic cystic polyps. So, this, this is just a lesion, of course.、Uh, again, with the benefit of hindsight,、uh, we, we get referred to these patients and、um, we,、uh, we know that there's a dysplasia somewhere.、Um, How would you describe this,、uh, Noria? What, what would you think? Is there a clear demarcation line in this? Yeah. So, we usually evaluate、uh, micro surface structure and the micro vasculature. So,、yes. how can I indicate?、Uh, you may have to stand here and <laughs>、yeah. uh, sort of uh, use the, the cursor if it's okay. Yeah. So, the, the pointer. Yeah. So, compared to, we always compare with the region. And the surrounding mucosa. So, this is surrounding mucosal pattern, and this is lesion pattern. So, when we compare each other, we can evaluate the marcation line here, like this. 
So I think this is very neoplastic region. And all, also inside, there's some irregular vasculature here. So probably surrounding mucosa is still a bit regular structure. So maybe kind of low grade dysplasia or adenoma, but uh, in some part, vas vasculature is very irregular. So I, su I suspect some focal high grade dysplasia is present. We, we don't need a pathologist uh, with <laughs> Noria. No? <laughs> Thankfully, no pathologist here. Uh, yeah, so it was indeed, and we mark around it. And uh, in this day and age, we uh, perform ESDs for these lesions. Uh, it, it's quite atypical, as, as Philip was saying as well, even in squamous uh, dysplasia, to, to find lesions which are one centimeter or smaller. So uh, it's, it's probably worthwhile or recommended that uh, an end block resection is performed, and if possible, uh, using the ESD method uh, such as this. Um, we don't pin them down as well as the Japanese do, and I doubt if we take uh, two millimeter slices. What, what do you think, it's, John? It's, you, it's probably cut in half. Yeah. Yes. <laughs> um, I, I mean, it, it is embarrassing, really. But um, but yeah, the, there's not r remotely as many slices taken, yeah. Uh, yeah. fortunately, and we, we're probably missing some disease process mm. there as yeah. as such. But our numbers are so small, which brings me to you know a number number of questions perhaps we'll work through the cases but you know how how can we change and, and move forwards using using the information we get from you yeah i, I think perhaps we should maybe ask andrew ruskovich you know how he slices <laughs> these sort of lesions but certainly i i think uh, the role of emrs um, especially f not for barrett's though that that's a different yeah. ball game altogether but um, i think uh, for gastric lesions and uh, squamous cell lesions, I think uh, an end block resection is always recommended. I think I'll just ring Andrew now and get him in on the weekend <laughs> to go yeah. back through my specimens. <laughs> <laughs> well, uh, so, so this is another sort of polypoid type lesion. Um, what do you think, uh, Noria? Sorry to put you on. His, he's not seen any of this. Uh, mm, difficult to say. <coughs> okay, again. Uh, yeah. Uh, reddish and uh, uh, elevated, but the uh, color and the pattern is almost similar to yes. central part. Yes. And then color change is also very gradual. And probably this is a uh, edge of the region. Yes. Basically, pattern different, but the uh, epithelial reach is continuous from the surrounding mucosa to the region. So I think this is covered with non-neoplastic uh, epithelium. So, but the inside, uh, there's a bit irregular vessel, but uh, still margin is a bit unclear. And uh, sometimes uh, inflammation also causes such kind of torturous yes. yeah, uh, pattern. So suspicious for neoplasia, but uh, very low confidence. So maybe I take biopsy. Okay. Yeah. From from here, from here. This, <laughs> we, no, he is actually right because this uh, this fantastic. So this is actually a subepithelial lesion. Okay, so subepithelial. So Noria is absolutely right. Uh, the surface pattern is similar or not too dissimilar to the surroundings, and that was actually a biopsy. And this was a uh, neuroendocrine lesion. So uh, this was uh, how the patient came back uh, after a single biopsy, um, which was taken. Uh, and uh, of course, uh, these sort of lesions uh, are more difficult to resect. They do appear slightly yellowish, um, but sometimes they can uh, sort of extend uh, fairly deep as well into the submucosa. So we decided to uh, try to get this end block, and you, you can actually see that, you know, it sort of disappears into the uh, submucosal fluid. It doesn't elevate like what we uh, expected to see, and uh, it is tricky. So when we do this, uh, sometimes they pin down, and uh, it can be quite tricky. And after resecting it, there was a small defect there, which uh, was uh, closed, and I decided to then just. Uh, uh, suture the remaining defect. 
so it's a neuroendocrine tumor and um, it is sometimes appears yellowish on white light endoscopy which which is quite an interesting finding um, this is a flat polyp uh, flat lesion but uh, again uh, you know uh, sometimes uh, that's why I was asking Noria you know, so we may see this and you know you may think it could have been a gastric ulcer there it's healing well you know so would you want to do something again with the benefit of hindsight uh, you know there was dysplasia detected in this lesion um, and um, we we went on to resect it I, I would say that the the pattern this is not quite dissimilar to the surrounding sometimes after biopsies the pits become a little bit larger um, so we uh, perform an ESD uh, for this patient this is a little bit more sinister again almost a polypoid type lesion um, just close to the pyloric ring and with some suggestion that perhaps there's a little bit of an erosion there um, and um, you can actually see some distortion of the pit pattern over there this lady uh, had multiple comorbidities so we decided to uh, sort of uh, resect the lesion interestingly it came back as a high grade uh, adenoma um, so it was good for her good outcome so that lesion was uh, taken off like that um, she was on anticoagulants and needed it I think she had a, an aortic valve so we, we kind of close the lesion as much as we can a little bit of the defect there the sort of suturing device couldn't get in and we put a couple of clips to sort that out and the pyloric ring wasn't close so yeah she, she was fine uh, I'd like to get Noria's uh, views on this um, lesion um, so this patient was referred to us biopsies again very nicely uh, picked up by the referring gastroenterologist um, and it uh, came back as uh, undifferentiated mm -hmm. cancer for consideration of a uh, resection um, I think it's quite difficult I know you did point out that sometimes when you look at the pit pattern mm -hmm. if they are sort of a corkscrew shape yes then it's in keeping with an undifferentiated cancer and if it's uh, a network pattern then it's differentiated cancer yes so but white light image bit blur. compared yeah. to a uh, yeah bit blur but uh, compared to surrounding mucosa slightly depressed like this so depressed region and a uh, bit whitish compared to surrounding mucosa so only white light image also suspicious for undifferentiated type and uh, there is demarcation line between surrounding mucosa and the uh, cancer and the uh, vascular pattern is not a network pattern just a very torturous yeah vessel can be seen so i think this is a typical finding of a uh, vascular job undifferentiated type yes yes yeah so so it's it's quite a nice case the thing is that when we looked further mm -hmm. um, so you can see the previous lesion perhaps above there mm -hmm. but uh, there was an extension and quite patchy undifferentiated cancer uh, obviously beyond uh, three centimeter three, uh, two centimeters in size um, and th th that was the case so this is the lesion which was close to the pyloric ring um, and uh, again uh, so it's not at the incisura now this is closer to the pyloric ring mm -hmm. and uh, what do you think Noria same I patient think, yeah uh, uh, the same same finding to yes. the previous lesion yes so may but uh, in between I think still yes. yeah yes. non-neoplasty yes. because uh, so it's a multiple lesion I yes. guess yeah yeah so you have yeah so you, you, you saw you're absolutely right so there was some some area in between the incisura mm -hmm. and this lesion below which was clear but of course in with regards to the multifocality and uh, the size um, we recommended surgery not yeah, yeah. not an endoscopic resection and uh, for our practice uh, undifferentiated type cancer sometimes extend subepithelially 
So before performing e endoscopy resection, we always take a uh, biopsy from surrounding mucosa, okay. whether there is no subepithelial extension or not. Okay. Yes. Couple of uh, questions coming in now. Um, uh, are there any standardized uh, protocols, uh, pathology protocols that recommend two millimeter uh, resections? Uh, I guess it's hard to put this question forward to non pathologists. Uh, in Japan, I guess it's standardized every two millimeter slices. Yes. You guys use that samurai knife every time? Or? <laughs> <laughs> I, don't, I don't know. <laughs> um, it's a question on uh, pre-endoscopic resection workup uh, for, for Philip, uh, for esophageal and um, gastric IMCs. Uh, should patients have a CT scan or a PET scan? So in general, we uh, of course detect the uh, esophageal uh, lesion by endoscopy and we characterize with uh, IEE and also magnification and uh, definitely to define the margin and also to observe and predict the depth of invasion. I think uh, there are also probably a question about whether you use the EUS or not. Mm -hmm. So from my practice, uh, if you are having a lesion of uh, SM2 or beyond, then we can recognize. So the only tricky point is uh, whether it's uh, M3 or SM1. So EUS also couldn't help to differentiate uh, between the, that uh, depth of invasion. But uh, we will also uh, generally <coughs> also practice the uh, EUS. EUS can look for uh, peri lymph node. Yes. Uh, in general, we would also do a, a PET CT uh, to just to confirm and to see whether there's any nodal uh, hypermetabolic uh, nodal uh, appearance. Um, another question, uh, Noria, you mentioned uh, something about fundic polyps and you said that you just follow these patients up. The mm -hmm. question is when and how often? Ah, eh, so maybe eh, fundic lamp polyp not, uh, eh, not necessary to survey, okay. get the surveillance because it's basically benign lesion okay. unless it is a uh, FAP patient or something. Yes. Okay, uh, can we put up the video again? Uh, since we still got another five minutes, uh, loads of videos here, so we're not short of them. Uh, this uh, this patient uh, presented with the uh, lesion, I, I think Tim would be familiar, um, in the upper esophagus, a uh, couple of centimeters beyond the upper esophageal sphincter. Uh, the issue is that the patient also has um, um, DVT in the past and uh, is on anticoagulants and has quite a few other comorbidities including an iodine allergy uh, or contrast allergy uh, many years ago. He's unable to confirm that so uh, we, we basically uh, uh, first looked at this lesion. Um, he was referred again I think a really good pickup uh, from, from the gastroenterologist who performed this. Um, high up in the esophagus, biopsy is taken, reveal uh, features in keeping with uh, squamous uh, dysplasia. Um, the issue is that with white light, it's quite difficult to ascertain the margins. Um, it's also quite narrow up there, um, and it was made worse after he was uh, intubated uh, for the resection. But um, what we're trying to do now is uh, to use narrowband imaging, and I know there's uh, some studies which has perfor been performed to say it's as good as Lugol's. Um, I still have r reservations with that. I think Lugol's is better uh, to demarcate the edges of the lesion. But we had no choice. Uh, we, we just couldn't uh, use uh, Lugol's in this instance. Um, and uh, this is, this is so sort of the lesion, a little bit ulcerated, you can see there and brownish, so uh, early squamous uh, sort of lesions appear more brownish compared to the surroundings. And of course, uh, we are now going to try to uh, use the dual focus mode to look at those uh, capillary uh, patterns, uh, which will be coming out soon. So uh, as, as Philip was mentioning, the, these are IPCLs, um, and, and Philip nicely has uh, classified them and uh, the IPCLs basically, if they are closed loops, uh, it signifies that this is either an epithelial or lamina propria type lesion. And if the loops start opening up, 
then you worry whether it's touching the muscularis mucosa or submucosa where the risk of lymph node metastasis goes up by 10% and beyond. So uh, the, the lesion was assessed and it appears that most of the loops were closed loops um, from what we can see. I was just not happy with the extent. It's so, so difficult to uh, work it out um, what the extent of the, the lesion is. I know Spiro in, in Perth had, has a similar case uh, which he diagnosed uh, a few few weeks ago, I think. Um, so you can actually see the closed loops there. Um, over there, if you can see that, those are all closed loops. So if the loops look like cauliflowers, uh, cauliflower, broccoli, or whatever vegetable you want to use, uh, if it's close, it's it's probably safe to do a, a resection, and if it's open, uh, then you'd be wondering if uh, the patient should have uh, something more. Uh, the thing is very high up, and it was very tricky. So uh, we decided to uh, organize a, a filter for the patient, um, and that was uh, thanks to John recommending that. Um, so he had a filter, and when the, the, the IVC filter was put in, um, they gave him some contrast, and he tolerated it. <laughs> so when we brought him back, we said, okay, let's try a low concentration of iodine. So we did that and waited. Um, the esophagus was very narrowed because he was intubated, um, and you, you can actually uh, slowly sort of make out that the lesion is circumferential in certain areas, um, especially higher up, as you can see there. But it's really very narrow, and there was a lot of uh, difficulty trying to uh, even push the scope down, and I, I couldn't quite explain this. So this from the lower edge, and uh, as you can see, as we pull it back up, um, that was the lesion. So, so we we resected it. Um, he he's uh, probably discharged today. This was done on uh, Wednesday, I think, um, and we got it out. Uh, we did inject some triamcinolone, uh, which which comes to my next question to to Philip. What what would you do with post uh, post resection sort of strictures? Uh, do you inject triamcinolone? Do you give them an oral? budesonide type slurry or do you give them oral steroids put in a stent um, I generally don't put in a stent uh, that's uh, quite difficult uh, to manage and I would uh, as I mentioned uh, in my lecture uh, do a surveillance uh, endoscopy I think there are more evidence of oral steroid now uh, that uh, you can avoid a uh, sort of co complication if you do a local injection of steroid. Sometimes uh, they have a problem of even, you know, after injection, there's some uh, small minor uh, perforation and a steroid effect. So, uh, but uh, in general, uh, we would be more liberal to use of the steroid nowadays. Uh, and uh, I have a kind of case just recently, um, two lesion. I have actually a video, but I can show you later on. So, okay. Uh, two two is of GESD in the same patient. So the <laughs> upper one, similar yes. to this, is circumferential. And uh, we need uh, circumferential ESD for that. And uh, afterwards, she has a uh, stricture, uh, which we expected. So I did uh, two times dilatation and also injection of steroid. And it's quite effective. So now she can tolerate a diet and the stricture formation is significantly less. In the past, we do serial dilatation. It requires us to have a six to eight sessions yes. before we can manage those uh, stricture. Yeah. So we injected uh, triamcinolone in this patient and started him on oral steroids as well. Um, th there's, a, th there's a link which uh, Spiro Raftopoulos from Perth has sent uh, uh, with regards to standard uh, pathology reporting um, from their college, um, uh, which is a part of the WA guideline. So uh, I will send this uh, to, to you as well. He's requested that this be sent um, to all the participants, and uh, we'll, we'll send this via email so you can have a look and maybe go back to your pathologist and tell them perhaps this is what uh, they could follow. Um, oh, 
Okay, that's another another uh, patient. Another another question. Uh, sounds like an ERCP question, but uh, so in patients undergoing ERCP, there are studies that show iodine contrast can be used in those who are allergic to intravenous contrast. Similarly, luminal contrast may be okay with allergies to iodine. What does the panel think? Um, so, <clears throat> I, I, I think, uh, so for uh, Lugo, uh, it's been uh, reported that because it's uh, less operator dependent, then you can see as Raj uh, demonstrated in this uh, 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 lesion that the margin is uh, better delineated with the Lugo. Uh, but then if you are using the uh, IEE, uh, from my experience, I think it's also very confident. The only issue is uh, when you are doing this uh, spray uh, with the Lugo in the proximal esophagus, if the patient is not, not intubated, you run a high risk of aspiration. So mm. I think that is uh, a, a the blind area, like uh, just like uh, three to five centimeter below the cricofringes where you are worry if you are spraying the Lugo without any intubation. Do you do routine intubation before you examine in, in Australia? Oh, no, no, no. Only for ESDs. And, yeah. I see. Yeah, no, it's not, not for... No, routinely we don't, no. Yeah. So Never. Even even if we need to use Lugols, we uh, basically... Um, uh, yeah, just use it cautiously. Start from uh, below um, and slowly pull, pull uh, coax the iodine towards the lesion by carefully suctioning. Yeah, uh, they sometimes, despite being really careful, they still do have a little bit of cough at the end and be a bit uncomfortable. But generally, start very cautiously, and not just spraying it liberally. No, yeah, it's it's very risky to do that. In terms of contrast allergy, we use as as surgeons, yes. we use um, intraoptical angiograms with contrast in contrast allergies. And quite a lot. Yeah. It's 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 yeah, you, you you have to be cautious in an anaphylactic yes situation, but otherwise most of them are just rashes. Yes. And they're perfectly safe in a luminal or um mm -hmm. or cholangiogram type setting. I'm sure you're the same with the RCP. We're twelve thirty Raj yes. if you Yep, um that's yeah, twelve thirty four. Okay. So uh, we will uh, break Thanks. for lunch and uh, we'll be back in um, short while and uh, we'll carry on. So thank you very much, Chess, John and Hosh, thanks. and thanks to the speakers. Thank you.